first start going through the Word of God just for some scriptures because we always want to, we always want to base what we're talking about out of scripture. And then after that, we kind of talk about just the kind of experiences uh, that I've experienced in the last 30 plus years uh, of watching the prophetic ministry. Uh, and then I want to actually go to some prophetic words that have recently been spoken and that we can go through. And you guys can kind of, if you want to take a note, write it down so that you can, because one thing the scripture talks about is judging and weighing or discerning things that are spoken. And so uh, we'll go ahead and start. With the Word of God, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. This is a very familiar one that everyone here I'm sure knows, but it says, verse 11, Ephesians 4 says, He was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So let me ask you a question. <coughs> Have we reached the unity in the faith and in the, and the full knowledge of the Son of God have we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? We're not there yet. You know, it, it's part of that whole thing of the kingdom of God where uh, it's the already, but they're not yet. I mean, we experienced some of that. As we're talking about the prophetic today, we experienced some of the prophetic, but we're not up to that level that we will eventually attain. Now, the rest of the scriptures I want to read out of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. And I want to look at the, really, you kind of need to read all through 1 Corinthians 12, also 13, also 14, but we're just going to pick some, some verses out. And so I'm going to look at chapter 12, verse 28. Because this is a different list, a different uh, list of different gifts that have been given by God to the church. And it says, in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those giving the gifts of healing, those able to help others with the help of the gift of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do they all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. So again, we have this picture of the Lord giving gifts to the church. And part of that is for the church to become mature to the fullness of what Christ has for us. So these different gifts, and it says, but equally desire the greater gifts. So when you go to chapter 13 of Corinthians, which we all know is kind of the, uh, the love chapter, you hear at the weddings, and we talk about how, what true love is. But also, if you go to, uh, to verse 9, it says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect disappears. So it's saying we all prophesy, but we prophesy in part. In other words, no one has the whole picture. It's like a, a giant jigsaw puzzle, you know, 100 piece puzzle. And you've got to put all the different pieces together to get the correct picture. And I actually, just while we're there, might mention that that's what 
uh, cessationist, which means just people who don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today, will use that verse because as it goes on, it says, uh, but when perfection comes, and they say that's the Bible, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. So they will use that saying that, you know, the, the gifts are no longer for today. But if you go read that passage, the next verse says, Now we see but poor, a poor reflection as a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So it's when we see him face to face, we don't need really prophecy. Until that time, all those gifts we need to be operational. All right. In chapter 14, I want to look at the first four verses. It says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, in that chapter before, he was talking about the love chapter. He said, you could have all the gifts, but if your motivation is not love, it means nothing. But here, but then it goes, picks right back up and says, yet eagerly desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you might prophesy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speak to men for their strengthening, their encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so the church may be edified. So especially the gift of prophecy and the purpose of it is for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Now the last Verse I want to look at is the same chapter, verses 24. And he's comparing tongues and uh, prophecy as you get down to this point in the chapter. And he says, But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everyone is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his hearts will be laid bare. So he will fall down, worship God, explaining, God is really among you. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word or instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. So think about that for a second. When we all come together, this is what we're supposed to do. Have a hymn, a song, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two of the most three should speak one at a time. And someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet and the in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the other should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is setting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. 
For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So he says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, you have kind of someone say, well, I couldn't help it. I had to prophesy because it's under the control of the prophets. And so everything is to be done in an orderly way. And the biggest part of that is that we are to weigh or discern carefully what is said. So we listen and we see if we have, do we have a, a witness in our own spirit? Is the Holy Spirit witnessing to us that, that what was spoken is right, is true, or not? And I'll make a distinction here between what I call simple prophesying, which is something everyone can do. We are all called to prophesy. We, we should be asking the Lord to give us words for someone else. We should ask the Lord to give us a picture, whatever way the Lord moves, so that we can edify, build up, strengthen the body of Christ. I call that simple prophecy, okay? But when you are prophesying on a different level, which would be about nations, about the world events, that's a whole different level of, of proven ministry, okay? What I would call really being a prophet. Just because you prophesy doesn't make you a prophet, okay? So one of my prayers for, for decades have been to see an increase of accuracy of the prophetic word and the clarity of the prophetic word, especially from that higher level of talking about, about prophets, okay? And I've been really uh, disappointed uh, in the pro prophetic ministry, like just going back to the election of 2020. A lot of these prophetic voices were saying <clears throat> there's going to be a red, a red wave. There was going to be uh, Trump would remain as president. And then when it didn't happen, most of them, you never heard anything back. Some would say, well, he really won. But, you know, but there was a couple. There was one, uh, Jeremiah Johnson was one who came back, and he apologized, and he said, I was wrong. I got caught up in all of the hoopla and things about Trump, and I was wrong and apologized for it, but many did not. So I was privileged back through the 1980s and the early 1990s to be around true prophetic prophets of the Lord. Back at that time, uh, there were people like Bob Jones, John Paul Jackson was there, uh, who am I thinking, Paul Cain, yes, and the prophetic ministry was incredible that was going on at that time. I have never seen that since that time. I remember um, Bob Jones prophesying about and that it's going to be a comet coming on a certain date, unknown to man. And sure enough, when it happened, time came, and all of a sudden it's in the newspaper. Comet, unexplained comet, appears, unknown to the scientist. There were uh, even some things that I thought was kind of weird because I thought he prophesied in 1985 and this was during the, the regular season. And Bob was not, a, didn't know a lot about sports, okay? He kind of had a, a big belly, and a lot of times his shirt would be halfway up. Uh, <clears throat> but, and he had a, that, that Arkansas draw, you know. And he said, yep, Royals are going to win. This is 1985. Royals are going to win the World Series. And, and then he said, and you know what? They're going to win 11 to nothing. And everybody thought, Bob, usually baseball scores are like one to nothing or three to two, something like that. Can't be 11 to nothing. And that was before they were in the playoffs and anything. 
So then the playoffs come. They win the playoffs. They get in the World Series. And sure enough, the last game, they beat just the St. Louis Cardinals 11 to nothing. And we go, well, you know, and, and, and part of me is thinking, well, does the Lord care about baseball? You know, I mean, what, what spiritual thing, you know, is in that? But I think it's just kind of a sign. You know, it's a sign of wonder showing us things even from daily life that, hey, I'm in control. I know the end from the beginning. And just a confident builder. There's also a time when he, he prophesied about snow coming. You know, these are events that you can't manipulate that happens in the heavens. And about snow would come on a certain date, and they would receive him at that date as a prophet. And sure enough, comes that date. And it was the first of spring, snow, and the snow was melting just, just exactly as he said. And then I had some, uh, actually finally got called out after all those years of sitting in the congregation and seeing people behind me and next to me and all over here and get called out. I never got called out, you know. I was like, does anybody know I'm here, you know. And then one day, Paul Kane, it was a couple thousand people called me out, and he was like, boom, 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 right, you know, right down the line. And so being a part of that, I've longed to see that happen again. And I, like I said, I haven't seen that since those days. So it's been a lot of years of seeing that level of prophetic ministry. But recently, and, and actually within this last year, I've become aware of a, of a young man, a young pastor named of, uh, Chris Reed. Some of you may have heard him, some of you may not. Uh, he actually started um, in ministry at the age of 19. He's probably, I'm guessing, maybe 40, something like that. And um, as an assistant pastor at the age of 19, and then he became a full pastor, lead pastor of um, church, what was it called, Revival Center in Peru, Indiana. And um, now he is actually lead pastor of Morning Star Ministries. You know, that's where Joni Ames is at, out of, and Rick Jordan has run that. And he's also now president of Morning Star Ministries. But I f- first came aware of him when he visited... Uh, International House of Prayer here in Kansas City. And by the way, back when those prophets were there, back in the 80s and early 90s, there was an Anglican priest from uh, Great Britain who came and visited and went back, and he wrote a book, and it was titled, Some Said It Thundered. And he was just going through and documented all the prophetic things that had happened. But anyway, so he, so Chris Reed goes to IHOP, which happened to be the same time that Francis Chan, uh, probably many of you may know that name, who's real big in the evangelical movement, wrote a lot of books, had a lot of big churches. He's on the conference you know, circuit a lot. Uh, Eric Metaxas, uh, he's, he's the intellectual uh, guy who wrote uh, Bonhoeffer and also just recently came out with a book about the death of atheism. But he's one of these really intel, you know, super intelligent type people. And both these guys come from a past of being cessationist. In other words, they didn't believe uh, in the gifts of the Spirit, and the prophecy was not for today. And then they got blown out of the water when Chris Reed was there, for one thing. And, and so it changed their whole perspective. And all of a sudden, overnight, you can have someone who doesn't believe in that, and all of a sudden, well... I guess I do believe in it now. And so he has been, um, I've kind of followed some of the uh, track records since that time. And so he's correctly, they have a, um, a prophetic conference every year. It's like the first of the year uh, of each year. And these are some of the things that he prophesied that have already come about. He prophesied about the economic issues, about the inflation Already, in, you know, that's already happening now, has been going on. He prophesied that that was going to be coming. He said, also said there was going to be an attack 
on Nancy Pelosi's family. Well, just recently, you probably all read the, the news and the stories all over the news about that guy who went in and beat her husband with a hammer. So that was all over the, the news. And he also prophesied, and this is a, far, a little farther back, but that there'd be a hurricane coming to the west coast of Florida and that they were to pray to min minimize the damage. And, of course, that happened, the one that hit Fort Myers and the Tampa area so bad. And that was a year and a half before it happened. He also said a woman would replace Boris Johnson as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Well, that happened, and she would be compared to Margaret Thatcher. And that was exactly when the headlines came out that she won. They were comparing her to that. Now, she didn't actually stay in office that long. So those are some of his track record that he's had, had incredible accuracy so far. So now my antenna's up. And so I want to, for us to weigh and observe, because there's some things that he has prophesied that have yet to be fulfilled as coming. And so put this in your, you know, file this in your mind so when you see things happen, you go, oh, I remember that. Okay, and to weigh carefully, discern what is said. Okay, so he said, just as Ron followed Margaret Thatcher to become president of the United States, a Ron would follow Liz Truss to become president of the United States. Okay, the Ron that followed Margaret Thatcher was Ronald Reagan. Right? So the Ron, I believe, would be Ronald DeSantis. Now, I don't know whether that's 24 or 28, but somewhere in the future. And here's another one. He said, Biden, President Biden would not finish his term as president. So that's be pretty measurable, right? Because he's already two years in to his presidency. And he also said Ron DeSantis would eventually become president. And again, there's a question of, was that 24 or is that 2028? He also said the economy would remain bad until around 2025. So after the next election in 2024, it wouldn't be till after that point, which would be a year into 2025, before the economy begins to turn around. But he was very strong to say, don't get in fear, because God is able to provide for his people. So in the midst of shakings, in the midst of things going south, in the midst of all the inflation, uh, probably a recession coming, God is able to provide for his people. The election cheating would eventually come to light. So eventually, proof will come that, yes, there was cheating that happened in the election. And after that, things will change in the way we vote. In other words, we will go back to what it used to be. There will not be any early voting. Everyone will vote on election day. Now here's one that's probably pretty quick because we're at the end of November now. It says in December there would be either a dirty bomb or damage to the nuclear facility in Ukraine. Okay, in December. And here's a big one. We don't have a time frame on this, but it says China and Taiwan would fight a sea battle in the South China Sea and that China would withdraw. So we were thinking the natural China would just overwhelm Taiwan just because of the size. But something happens that keeps them where they actually ended up withdrawing, although there'd be a lot of ramifications, as you can imagine, of that happening. 
also said China's leader, Xi Jinping, who's basically right now a dictator for life, will be disposed and replaced, but unfortunately with someone even worse. But he will not last long. And then there will be a revolution in China, a, a rising up of the people. He went on to say that COVID was used in China to keep the people from revolting. And you know, even right now, there are major cities in China. I mean, we're talking about millions of people in, in these cities that are completely locked down, and they can lock them down for up to 100 days where you don't leave your house. Now, here's another one. This will be a big one. Israel will make a surprise attack on Iran's nuclear program. Now, we know for some time Iran has been building and wants to build a nuclear weapon. And Israel has been saying for a long time, we can't allow that to happen. So they will make a surprise attack upon Iran. And you can imagine the hornet's nest that that would stir up and the, all the repercussions that will come because of that. So that would be a huge thing. I mean, that wouldn't just affect them. It would affect the entire world. Another one was another virus is coming. No details, no what, what does that look like? Don't know, just that another virus is coming. Not COVID, but something else. So these next ones, I go back to you know, what Bob Jones did about prophesying about the royals, and I'm going, what does this have to do with the kingdom of God or with spiritual things, you know? And it has to do with the royal family. But there are a lot of people who follow the royal family, not just in England, but, a, you know, here in the United States. It's like a big deal. It's kind of like a culture phenomenon. So he had a whole list of things here about the royal family. And he said that Charles, who's going to become the king of, of Great Britain, United Kingdom, he will make a slip on a hot microphone that will reveal much and damage the royal family. So it wasn't planned. It was inadvertent on a, on a hot microphone. Mic he didn't think microphones on. It was recorded, and it's going to cause great uh, damage to the royal's family. Prince Harry and Meghan will divorce, and Harry will realize he has been played as a fool. And I'm going, do I really give a rip? Well, I guess I don't know. But, you know, I'm just saying. <clears throat> then there's a stone of scone. Anybody know what that is? Raise your hand if you do. I didn't know. Okay, the stone of scone is a, it's a stone that's actually in Scotland. And it's where every king throughout the history, they use that to, uh, it's also called uh, Stone of Destiny, Coronation Stone, and it's where they coronate the, the new king. So they use that stone. So he says something's going to happen to that, whether it is stolen, whether it is destroyed, something is happening. And so that's just one of those you know, things you go, well, what's got, got to do with anything? But I think what they are, they're markers. You know, they're, they're like signposts, again, which show that the Lord knows the end from the beginning. He's aware of the intricate things of our life, what's happening in your life, my life, on a worldwide scale. Uh, Bases, and I think it also because in the midst of great shaking, 
like again, some of these things are going to be shakings. You know, the economy, war, China, Taiwan, Israel attacking. Those are shaking things that's going to affect not just them, but, but the world. That we can take comfort that the Lord knows it, he's, he's covered, and none of it was a surprise to him. And it made me think of, of different, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, most of the prophets, you know, you think of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, most of them were prophesying warning. You know, they were warnings. They were, you know, turn and repent or else your nation is going to be destroyed. And so that was their kind of message. It wasn't a very bright message. and wasn't very... Uh, actually accepted by a lot of people. Most people did not. They needed to repent and turn, and there was no turning. And eventually, those things happened. And like in the case of Jeremiah's life, it was like a, almost a 40-year time of ministry when he first started till judgment fell. Same thing with Ezekiel. They went through a lot of hard things to bring that message. In the New Testament, you know, I think of people... Uh, like Agabus. Agabus was a prophet. He's mentioned in Acts a couple different times. One is where when the church is at Antioch and Agabus comes and that's where Paul and Barnabas were there and that's where they first were called Christians. And then the prophet comes from Agabus, comes from Jerusalem and he says there's going to be a severe famine in the land throughout the Roman Empire. You know, and I always thought, well, what, what do you do? So I was interested in kind of the response because the response wasn't, well, let's pray so that it won't happen. They didn't do that. They took practical steps. They took up collections for money for the saints. He went to, that's where Paul went to all the different churches collecting to send back to Jerusalem to help them through the time. And I also think about, um, you know, as, as Paul's coming back, he's on his last uh, missionary journey. He's coming back. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And everybody's getting these prophetic words. And every place he goes, they say, don't go to Jerusalem. Because if you do, they're going to they're gonna put you in prison. They're going to be, maybe even kill you. Okay? And... In one case, he goes and Philip the evangelist, um, he had four daughters that prophesied. And they all prophesied the same thing. And in every city he went to, they were saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit shows us that if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be put in chains. Now, it's interesting. And Agabus comes, and he says the exact same thing. But what was interesting is Paul says, I know, you know, but I'm willing to go and not only to be put in chains, but to die. So in one way you think, well, why is it going to, you know, this is the word of the Lord came, but yet he goes ahead and he believes the word and he knows it. But, he, but that, you know, it's just the response has kind of made me wonder. Like so many of these things, they're signs that make you wonder. They capture your attention. So these are some prophetic words that have been spoken. And like I say, time will tell. But I think those are things that we need to be paying attention to. And then as you begin to see things happen, become encouraged, even the things that are negative. Because you, you were warned, hey, this thing's going to happen. This war is going to break out. And so you're not shocked. You're not in a place of fear. You know that God is truly in control. But we are to, to take those things, weigh them, and if there's things we need to respond personally, then we need to do it. But I think for me, it's just encouraging that I think we're beginning to see a breakthrough in the prophetic ministry of things that we haven't seen for like I said, I haven't seen for decades and decades. 
to see the prophetic word coming forth for the church. And I think it also means an upgrade in what we call simple prophecy, a prophesying to one another, an upgrade in that. And so be expectant of that. Not only be expectant of it, but begin asking the Lord. Because it says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. That means you go after it. You don't say, well, if the Lord did give me, he'll give it to me. No, you got to ask. you got to be seeking. Because he wants to give us upgrade in that realm. So there's some real exciting times coming ahead of us. There are some times that are going to be kind of shaky, kind of could put you in the fear, but we're not supposed to be in the fear. We're supposed to have an assurance that God has all of it under control. He will take care of us, even if it kills you, literally. <laughs> you know, even if you die, it's all right, you know, because we know where we're going. So, again, just kind of note some of those things. Be asking the Lord for your own increase of the gifts of the Spirit. Ask the Lord for words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Ask the Lord for those gifts of healing. Ask the Lord for prophecy. Ask that Lord for the gift of faith and the working of miracles. He wants to increase all those things in our midst. And so we're, we're coming to a place where the level is going to go up and up. But we need to be asking and pressing in to that. All right, I'm going to end with a word of prayer. And then we want to have the, uh, again, the opening here in the front for anyone who needs prayer for anything or if you just want to come and soak in his presence feel free to do that we're going to have some music in the background so lord we just come lord thanking you lord that you have not left us without a voice lord you have been faithful lord even to show us things that are coming that we may take that comfort in you knowing that you will provide for all our needs. Lord, again, that you know the end from the beginning. None of it is a surprise for you. So, Lord, we do ask for that upgrade, that upgrade of the prophetic in our lives. We ask for that increase of your presence, of your power, we ask for that increase of all of the gifts of the Spirit in our lives, Lord. That you would take us higher, that you would take us farther than we've ever been before. So, Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord. We love your word. We love the things that you have given to your church. Until we reach that place of complete unity and until we get to that place of the full measure of the stature of Christ. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen and amen. Again, if anyone